How many people have spent the night in a hospital? That you've spent the night in a hospital? I actually was thinking back, and I don't think that I've actually spent the night in the hospital, like admitted, maybe in the ER because when it's crazy, but um, I don't think I've spent you know, a couple days or even admitted that I can recall or remember. And, and the thing is, is, is because I haven't, I don't really know for sure, but I do know that there, there's at some point, now it might be two days or, or I'm not sure exactly when, but if you're in the hospital long enough, you're laying in a bed long enough, a nurse is going to come in and she's going to kind of roll you. She's going to kind of get you to move because they don't want you to put too much pressure on one area and, and you know, develop bed sores. And the goal though is to eventually have you stand. That that is the best posture for you to stand and to start moving. That that is the goal. And see, your, when you stand, it is actually the most health, healthy posture for your body is to stand. You know, one of my favorite topics to preach on is the promises of God. I mean, there is just something powerful about the promises of God. Amen? And, and so, you know, you will hear a lot of times topics preached on the promises, you know, like he will never leave you nor forsake you. That, you know, the promise of grace and forgiveness, do not fear for I am with you, said Isaiah. You know, the promise of peace, the promise of the Holy Spirit. We have all of these great promises and you've probably heard one message or a, a number of messages. I know I've preached probably on all of those. But you know what's one promise that you don't hear a lot preached on? It's the promise of persecution. The promise of persecution. Yes, you did hear me right. I said persecution. And that is a promise from the Lord, from Jesus himself, actually. It came out of the lips of Jesus. And it came at a time where Jesus is doing his famous Sermon on the Mount. So he is speaking and he gets all of 10 verses in. 10 verses in to Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, and this is where we pick it up, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 11, 12, it says this. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Do you notice he said why they persecute you, why they say that? Not because you're a jerk, <laughs> not because you're mean, Okay, not because you're rude, not because some, you cut somebody off in line, or because of me, Jesus says. Rejoice and be glad because what great is your reward in heaven. For the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, we've been brainwashed in America to take the path of least resistance. Have you noticed? The path of least resistance and, and 2020 really just catapulted that to a, a whole new level, right? I mean, you can get pretty much anything door dashed to your house. You can go to any store, order online, be able to pick it up curbside. Don't even have to get out of your vehicle. They'll just bring it to you. They'll get it delivered to your house. I mean, drive through, I mean, you just, you name it. I mean, from groceries to food to, you know, whatever your heart desires, it's a path of least resistance. But here's the thing. We also have been brainwashed to, feel, to think, I cannot offend anybody. Because you know what? Offending somebody creates confrontation. And you have been, we've been programmed not to have confrontation. So we will shy away and take the path of least resistance. I don't want to say this in the office area because somebody might be offended. So I'm going to take the path of least resistance so I don't hurt somebody's feelings. I'm not saying we go out and purposefully hurt people, but I think we've been staying a little too quiet. I think that we have been being a little too reserved and taking the path of least resistance when it comes to our faith. And I think it needs to stop because here's the thing. Pretty much every time Jesus spoke, he offended somebody. Pretty much every time he talked, he offended 
somebody with the truth of God's word, with the truth of his father. Now, here's the thing is from day one, as your pastor, I have said, okay, we're not going to offend people when they walk into our building with a dirty, unclean, unkept church. Okay. Or we're not going to offend people with grumpy greeters. Okay. That we are not going to offend people with confusion on what happens when I walk in the building. That where do I check my kids in? Is this an easy system? Where do, where's the bathrooms? What, what do I do here? We're not going to offend people with outdated decor, a look or style. We're, we're not going to offend people with bad music. <laughs> you know, thankfully, we don't have to worry about that. We're not going to offend people with awkward silence because the person doing offering doesn't know when in the order service is supposed to be on the platform. And man, those pastors don't know what they're doing and just unorganized. And we're not going to offend people like that. I believe we need to do everything that we do, we need to do with excellence because it's being done to the Lord. But let me tell you, I have no problem offending people with the truth of God's word. None. I have no problem because here's the thing is when you stand for God's word, eventually you're going to offend somebody. Eventually it is going to happen. But here's the thing, what Jesus said, you remember, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. That's what we're living for. It's for heaven, for eternity, not for popularity amongst men, living for the audience of one. And Jesus said, great is your reward that is in heaven. We're going to be taking a look tonight at a man who stood in the face of adversity, who stood in the face of persecution. In 1 Kings chapter 18, we're going to be looking at Elijah. And I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory about Elijah. Back in chapter 17, he goes to King Ahab and tells him, hey, there's going to be a drought. All right, so you better get ready. Elijah leaves. Sure enough, it stops raining. King Ahab, he, he's upset. He sends guys, hey, let's find this prophet of God. We want to kill him. Three years into the drought, Elijah goes back to King Ahab, tells him, hey, You've abandoned the ways of the Lord. Stop. Hey, gather all of Israel, Elijah says. Bring your 450 prophets of Baal and meet me on Mount Carmel. So Elijah is on Mount Carmel with all of Israel watching and listening. The prophets of Baal are there. And basically... We have now a duel that is going to happen, a showdown of epic proportions. In the midst of persecution, Elijah stood. He said, I'm going to stand for the truth of who God is. In the midst of King Ahab wanting to kill me, I'm going to stand. And this is what he said in verse 24 in chapter 18. He says, then you call on the name of your God and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God who answers by fire, he is God. A duel, a showdown between the true God and this Baal God. And he says, You know what? We're going to prepare a sacrifice. We're going to get a bull. We're going to prepare this. And the God who answers by fire, that is the one true God. Now here's the thing. is for you, chances are you're not going to go to work tomorrow and have a duel, okay, with a co-worker and say, all right, whoever's God answers by fire, that is the one true God. Chances are, and I would not suggest it either, that this is going to happen to you. But you know what, Will? Conversations will come up in your workplace, in your schools, where you can be silent or you can choose to stand. There's going to be conversations that happen that that people are talking about things that are contrary to your faith. What are you going to do? Are you going to keep it to yourself or are you going to stand? Because what if you started viewing your workplace 
as a mission field instead of just a place where you go to collect a check. That this is my mission field that I'm going to. Your schools, your workplaces, your neighborhoods, some of you, your families. That when I go here, this is my mission field. I am taking, I am representing Jesus Christ. See, Elijah, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of wanting to get killed, of, of King Ahab wanting to kill him, he says, all right, we're going to have a showdown. We're going to prepare two bulls. We're going to get two altars ready. And the God that answers by fire is the one true God. So Elijah says, hey, you guys got 450 prophets. I'm all by myself here. So I'm going to let you go first. You go first. Sure enough, these 450 prophets of Baal, they start praying, they start dancing, they start doing everything that is their custom from morning until noon, the Bible says, and nothing. Nothing happens. So about noon, Bible says, Elijah begins to taunt them. He really begins to make fun of them. He's like, you know, hey, uh, maybe your God is traveling. He can't really hear or he's deep in thought or he might just be busy. Oh, I know. He's sleeping. Your God, he's probably taking a nap. Oh, some translations say, you know what? I think he's in the bathroom. So you might want to speak up a little bit. I mean, you can just hear the sarcasm in Elijah's voice because he knows, right? He, he knows. So, so, so these prophets of Baal, they start slashing themselves and cutting themselves. The Bible says their blood is flowing as is their custom and nothing. As Elijah taunts them, we read in verse 28, so they shouted louder. So they shouted louder. Here's the thing is, just because you shout louder doesn't make you right. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone and maybe that conversation goes from a conversation to like a debate to like a heated argument and, and voices start to get raised and one of the people just start raising their voices quicker and louder and louder? Just because they raise their voice and shout doesn't make them right. See, I feel as though our culture, media, and the world that we live in are starting to shout louder. They're starting to shout. They're starting to shout with evil legislation that they're trying to put through. They're starting to shout with uh, social media censorship. They're starting to shout with the federal government with who they appoint in cabinet positions. I want to talk about this for a second. In 2015, in California, they passed a law called the Reproductive Fact Act. And this bill, this piece of legislation that passed at the state level, it mandated pro-life centers, pregnancy centers, to promote abortions. So what they would have to do is, is post large printed signs in the waiting room. So these young girls were sitting in a pregnancy center, sitting in a pro-life pregnancy center. And on the wall would have to be in large print to let them know that you can have a state-funded abortion. Here is the number, 1-800-fill-in-the-blank. So... These pregnancy centers, and maybe you're not familiar with that term, pregnancy center, with a, a, an example of that locally here is CareNet. CareNet is a pro-life pregnancy center. Planned Parenthood is not a pro-life. They believe in abortions, performing them. And, and here's the thing. This is what Isaiah said. He said, he who made you, who formed you in the womb. We believe that God formed every single person, that he made you, 
David says this, for you, were cre- for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. God made you and God created you. And pregnancy centers all over the United States and here locally, CareNet, they, they give free pregnancy tests, information and resources for, these, for pregnancy options for these young girls, for, well, for anybody. Free STD testing with a local physician, an ultrasound, counseling and parenting classes. And this bill in the state of California was going to mandate that these pregnancy centers promote abortions. That bill was co-sponsored by then California Attorney General Kamala Harris and supported by Xavier Becerra, who vowed to aggressively enforce this law. Xavier became the Attorney General after Kamala Harris, and he was he was ready to enforce this to the fullest potential of the law. Thankfully, the U.S. Supreme Court in 2018 struck down this bill, citing freedom of speech. But that man, Xavier Becerra, is our president's pick to be the secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services. And we clearly see the agenda of these officials in California and now have the backing and power of the federal government. See, here's the thing is I believe wholeheartedly that the promises of God are always yes and amen. And you know what Isaiah said in chapter 54, verse 17? He said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. I believe it doesn't matter what kind of weapons that the enemy is forming. They will not prosper against us as believers. We need to be willing to stand on God's word. Stand when it's uncomfortable. Stand when it's not popular. Stand for the truth of who God is. Because let me tell you, church, they're starting to shout. They're starting to shout. But never count out the people of God. Because the power that we have through the Holy Spirit that is alive and well on the inside of us, man, there's nothing that we can't do through Christ. Amen? Those prophets of Baal, man, they started to shout. They danced, they chanted, they cut themselves, and absolutely nothing happened. The Bible says in Verse 29, it says, but there was no response. No one answered and no one paid attention. Absolutely nothing happened. So what does Elijah do? Elijah, in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 30, let's read it. It says, then Elijah said to all the people, come here to me. They came to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Worship team, you can go ahead and come back. See, the altar of the Lord was a place where the Israelites, the people of God, would come to sacrifice. And it says that Elijah repaired the altar of the Lord. He repaired it. Which tells us something. It tells us that the altar that Elijah was building was not new. That there was once a remnant of an altar already there in existence. There was already an altar there, but it had been torn down. Maybe it was by the prophets of Baal. Maybe it was from, you know, the Israelites decided to, you know, worship the Baals. But what we know is that there used to be an altar. And Elijah said, let's go. I'm going to watch me where I'm going to repair this altar. Let me ask you. The enemy tore down the altar of the Lord that Elijah was repairing. What in your life has the enemy torn down? What have you allowed 
the, into your life that the enemy has torn down, your faith, your belief, addictions, what is it that the enemy has torn down? It's time to rebuild. It's time to rebuild the altar. See, in verse 31, it says this. It says, Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Your name shall be Israel. So he took 12 stones, it says, each to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And Elijah starts rebuilding this altar. And, and you see, I, I believe that Elijah took 12 stones because he wanted to remind the Israelites of who they were, of where they came from. You have to remember, we came from Jacob. Remember Jacob, the one that God turned his name to Israel? We are his descendants. At this time, 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel were not serving the Lord, they were serving Baal. And I believe that Elijah, that he was trying to remind these, these Israelites, hey, it doesn't matter how far you've gone. It's time to come back. It doesn't matter the mistakes that you've made in your life. It's time to come back to the altar of the Lord. It's time to get right with God. It's time to rebuild your life. It's time to go back you are, we are the people of God. That's what Elijah was trying to get across to these Israelite people, that we are the people of God. We have strength, we have power. I am one man standing, but watch the faithfulness of our God. Just watch God show up, Elijah is saying. We're gonna build, we're gonna build. He builds an altar. This is obviously a much scaled down version of what Elijah rebuilt. But he built the altar of the Lord. He wanted to remind them, you're chosen by God. And I feel as though I need to remind somebody here today, you are a child of God. That you've been forgiven, that there's a God that loves you more than you will ever know that his grace covers a multitude of sin and that Jesus died so he could have a relationship with you. See, Ephesians 1 verse seven, it says this, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, redemption through his blood. And it doesn't matter how far you've gone, doesn't matter how big of a sin, that, that, how big your failure is, Jesus, Paul is saying here, you have redemption through his blood. I'm here to remind you today that his grace is sufficient for you. Maybe you need some of that grace today. Maybe you're watching online and wandered off a little bit. I want you to know that his grace is sufficient for you. Wherever you find yourself today, you can never be too far away from the Lord. Elijah, he planned and he prepared. He had a right heart and he brought something of worth. See, he prepared a bull, okay? He laid it on the altar. But before Elijah prayed, the Bible records that Elijah poured water on the altar. And not just a little water, he poured a lot, actually. It says he took four jars, and then we're going to read verse 34. Elijah says, do it a third time. So they'd already poured three times. Then he says, do it a third time. He ordered, and they did it a third time. The water ran down the altar and even filled the trench. You see, I've always looked at this part of the story as Elijah pouring water on this altar to remove any doubt. Because he rebuilt this altar. He rebuilt it. So he's like, you know what? Uh, you know, we're in a drought. 
I don't, I don't want to anybody to have any doubt about the Lord when he shows up with fire. I don't want anybody to question that, hey, maybe there was a spark in there and you know what, something kind of, you know, combusted and that's where the fire came from. Elijah's like, no, 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 do it again, do it again. And three times he pours water all over the sacrifice, all over the altar. The Bible says it poured down and it filled the trenches all over the, around the altar. But you know what else I believe? I believe that the water was part of the sacrifice. I believe the water was part of the offering. Because think about it, they were in a drought for three years. So what is probably the most sought after commodity? Water, and rained in three years. And here Elijah is taking water and pouring it all over. Tons and tons and tons of water all over. I believe what Elijah was saying when he was pouring water on is he's saying, you know what? I'm all in. I I'm all in, Israel. Pay attention. I I'm all in. I'm not going to leave anything to chance. Water represents life. And Elijah was pouring out his lifeline all over this altar. It was his sacrifice. It was part of the offering. This rare commodity. And he was saying, all right, God, <laughs> it's now or never. It's now or never, God, I need you to show up in my life. First Kings 18, verse 38, Elijah prayed. And then it says, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones and the soil and licked up all the water in the trench. Let me tell you, there's something about going all in. There's something about not having a plan B, about saying, okay, God, uh, this is it. It's you, I need you to show up in my life or I'm in trouble. I, I need you to show up, I need a miracle. And there's something about being desperate. Elijah was desperate for God to show up. He needed him because if he did it, then he was dead. Elijah was all in. Elijah was all in. See, when we believe God's word cover to cover, we're all in. When we live it out, because there are people who pick and choose what they want to believe in this book. And they try to live a Christian faith and it's flawed. You can't do it. They try, they're miserable. But when you believe this cover to cover and you live it out, you're saying, God, I'm all in. And as believers and as a church, we need to be all in because here's the thing. If you look at what the people's response was, in verse 39, we read, it says, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. The same people that were worshiping Baal were all of a sudden laid prostrate saying, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. See, when we go all in, and we stand, we rebuild the altar, we bring something of worth and we go all in in our faith. Guess what? Persecution is gonna come, guaranteed. At some point, you are gonna be persecuted for your faith. You are going to offend somebody with the truth of God's word. It's going to happen, but you know what else is gonna happen? Is we're gonna see a harvest of souls like never before that we are going to see God's name lifted up. We're gonna see people that were far from Christ come into a relationship with him when we are willing to stand and go all in. Are you willing to go all in today? Those of you watching online, are you willing to go all in? Abandon everything that you've ever known and follow God at his word and this is it. This is all that we need. Why don't you go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes. And I wanna ask you, do you need some grace in your life tonight? Do you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? This is a call for you who are online, watching online as well. Do you need repentance? Maybe you were once a believer and you've drifted off. 
Maybe you've never made a decision like this before, but your time is now. His grace is sufficient for all. With every head bowed, every eye closed, that you would say, you know what, Pastor? I need to step into a relationship with Jesus today. Maybe it's a recommitment. Maybe it's a commitment for the very first time. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if that's you today, I want you to just go and slip your hand up. Say, yeah, that's me, Pastor. I need to step into a relationship with Jesus might be for the first time, but it might be a recommitment. For those of you that are watching online, this is for you too. That you need to step into a relationship with Jesus. That you need grace and forgiveness in your life. I want everyone to go ahead and stand to your feet today. And maybe you are a believer already. You've made that commitment. You've been walking um, in line with God's word. And, and you would say, you know what, Pastor? I, I feel like I just need to go a little step further. I need to go all in. Um, I, I, I need to take that extra step. I know that God is calling me and asking me to take a stand. Maybe it's in my workplace. Maybe it's in your school or family or neighbor, wherever it is. But you say, you know what, Pastor? I know that God is calling me to take a stand and that I need some strength tonight. I need some wisdom. God, I need you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. If that's you, we're going to sing a song together. And I want to invite you to come forward. Allow God to speak to you. If you're watching online, this is for you too. Allow God to speak to you. Close your eyes if you're able to, and just allow the Holy Spirit to fill you, and I believe He will fill you with strength, with power, with the power of His Holy Spirit, so that when we are called upon, we can stand on the truth of God's Word. Let's sing this song together, and we'll be back to close in a minute.